How do you know when you're home? British Columbia is where we learn to move through the mountains. Where we dreamt of elsewhere. Of what was around the next corner. And over the next horizon. A world apart. the same. It's springtime and we've returned to make a traverse across BC's coast range. With three weeks of food and equipment packed, we're attempting to walk, ski and float our way from the heart of the province, up and over the icy spine of the coast mountains, to the salty inlets of the Pacific. Along the way, we're asking a not so simple question. How do you know when you're home? The Coast Mountains are the western edge of BC, They're the last mountains of North America. They're right next to the ocean, they get hammered by the wind and the storms. They're wet misty, unknown, mysterious. They run from Vancouver, 1,500 kilometers all the way up the coast to Alaska. Dozen big ice fields all the way up the coast. They're hidden away in these, up at the head of all the long inlets. And the storms sort of sweep up there and are pushed up onto these high peaks. They, they dump all their snow and form these big ice fields. The coastal side is just bathed in lush rainforest with moss hanging off everything. And then the interior side, you've got sort of pine trees running up these high valleys back into the mountains. And in between, there's just this range of peak after peak after peak. The roads only cross the mountains four times in, in their 1,500 kilometer length. You know, when I first got the idea that you could do these kind of trips, you know, we'd go off on a three-week trip like that, and there'd, we'd be literally the only people in, in a thousand kilometers of mountains out there skiing and doing something like that. To us visitors, the mountains on the horizon are vast wilderness. But we're traveling where the Chilcotin people have lived and moved across the land with the seasons, through the mountains, to the Pacific Ocean, for centuries. You know, they say, our, our elders always tell us that um, when you're inside your mother's womb, that you're already learning the Chilcotin way because the mom is speaking Chilcotin, the father is speaking Chilcotin. Home is language, home is culture, home is people. Home is history. Home is our, our drumming, our, our ceremonies. So home is a safe place. You're angry because your mom and dad are not with you, you're with other children, and you're trying to survive, and you're told that your language, your way is wrong, you're, you're told that this different religion is more important. So that mass confusion over generations creates abuse. We want to bring that home back. You know, we are repairing our home, we want to bring our home back. The chief tells us that he spent most of his life battling for the land surrounding Chilco Lake, the lake we're about to cross. 
Two years ago, the Supreme Court of Canada granted his people title to their land here, a place they've called home for centuries, a first in Canadian history. We want to be able to use this land so that we could hunt and fish and be able to use its resources to survive. And it's going to be a lot of hard work. We don't want to leave devastation to our next generation. So we're open to new ways. To me, home is to be allowed to do that. BC's wilderness has a history of attracting people to its edge. People who didn't find acceptance or fit into the society they came from. Who needed more space and found a home in the wild. It sounds like from everything you've told me that like this place allows you to be Roland. Yeah, yeah, this is Roland. <laughs> this is a place where, well, otherwise if I would be somewhere else, then I probably might be scared of myself because there's too many things which I don't like somewhere else. I'm a peaceful person, so that's why, for me, there was the other way. Uh, I had to run. I wanted to be with the soil. I wanted to grow a garden. I wanted just to go back to the basics, like build a basic home. And this was not possible in Germany, so well, this wish coming to Canada, this is possible here. And I could basically not get enough of it. 360 degrees mountains and, uh, and wilderness. And I thought, okay, that's it. I found a place. No, with no tracks, with nothing. The only tracks probably sometimes from animals. Like there was coyotes, there was wolves out there. So this was, uh, it was a totally new feeling. Home, well, I can feel home everywhere as long as I'm home with myself. But when you come back and you're back on the property and back in the Maya, then it's a feeling, okay, this is where I belong. Home is being somewhere where I feel, where I don't have to be afraid. If it would work out that way, that I can stay here till I drop dead, then this is where I want to drop dead. I don't want to end up in an old folks' place, eh? <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Out of Roland's boat, we begin our upward walk towards the ice field, and eventually the Pacific Ocean. We've got butterflies in our stomachs and five days of food on our backs that will hopefully last until we reach the first of three airdropped food caches. If each footstep isn't wisely placed through the next 13 kilometers of thick forest, Nine Mile Creek will chew us up.
sucker. I just about lost both my nuts. <laughs> Go bear! Go bear! After the river nearly swallows forest and almost steals his skis, and too many close calls teetering top heavy over sharp pointy things, we're looking forward to hitting the snow line before someone gets hurt. Chad's bear call masks the hunger pangs, having forgotten to pack his snacks for the first leg of the trip. With a week's worth of food and 65 kilometers of ice field ahead, there's an exhilarating freedom before us. Self-contained vessels crossing an ocean. That's amazing when you realize that you're the only person here as far as you can look. go for a walk, you just keep on going and uh, any direction you go, it's just space and nothing. Nowhere where there's nobody there beside you, it's just you. And then there's nature. And this is a, a totally different feeling. It takes you to a different place, you know, our culture, people, it's all irrelevant when you're out there. You know, it's a different way of, of relating to the earth. And I've always been fascinated by that. You know, literally when you're out in the mountains, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what your name is. Your names are just made up. There is no name, you know, like words, all that stuff. It's some stuff that we make up. And that, I think, is hard to find other places.
kind of two sides to it. You know, they say home is where your heart is. So that's kind of one side. And then the other side is that the earth is our home. And then for me, I think that when you're coming home, that's sort of combining the two. So it's when you're in a landscape that it just makes your heart sing. And you, know, it's just, you just feel alive and speechless at how incredible it is. For me, that's, that landscape is mountains, that part of the earth, and it's you know, the coast mountains. And just being in it, I feel at home and alive and, and, and just sort of in awe of how incredible it is. You know, at some point in the traverse, you know, you, you get up high and you can see a long ways and maybe you can see way in the distance and then you realize that you're going to go way beyond what you can see. And you can look back and see where you've come from and you can't even see where you started. And I just love that. It makes you feel like you're, you're right deep in the wilderness. I certainly don't feel like I'm in the middle of nowhere when I'm out there. I feel like I feel like I'm at home. So, but at the same time, there's also this sense of it's like you're on the edge of it, this great unknown. You're sitting on the shore, and it's just this. You know, you're to the edge of the, you're on the edge of the universe. You're not listening for anything. It's like being a kid at the beach. You don't. It doesn't really matter if you find anything under the rock. All right, here I go. It's just the excitement, the fact that you're listening, the fact that you're looking. That's, that's what's important. I remember the way Driving on the way Speeding all the way Alone in the rain I was rehearsing a part From down at the bar My mouth smelled like a drink With two weeks of rock and ice in between, we had walked from the interior pines toward the smell of coastal hemlocks, filling our nostrils. From our final food cache, we fueled up, grabbed our inflatable pack rafts, and spent the day bushwhacking the 2,000 meter vertical to the Southgate River below. And then when you come down to the coast, all of a sudden it hits you, it's, the air is moist and 
and then just everything is covered in foliage and leaves and greenery and moss and then the, and you've got these huge hemlocks and, and fur and so on and it's just, just everything feels the way it's supposed to. Because it's sort of like it's an intimacy. You know, you're intimate with your home and where you live. If you go somewhere else, you don't have that intimacy. You know, you can appreciate it and it's beautiful, but but it's when you, you know when you're back home where you live, you know the feelings, all these subtleties. You get to know them in a different way, and they become part of you. It's like spending time with someone you love. You just appreciate them for what they are. I think a lot of people know me as, as the woman that lived up in the middle of nowhere. And I was, I was quite young when I, when I went up there, and, and I guess I, I did a lot of growing up there. So I became a, myself there. At the age of 19, Giselle, her brother, and a few friends left their home in the city of Vancouver for the shores of Butte Inlet the dramatic reach of Pacific Ocean that will mark our endpoint, a 40-kilometer downstream paddle. There she learned to log trees by hand, fish and hunt, and made just enough money to survive, finding home at the base of these mountains. It was an easy decision. I, it, I just was drawn there. And once I went there, I was like, this place is unbelievable. It's magnificent. I never want to leave. And I stayed for a very long time. Yeah. In the diary of moment, no one was hurry, but no sooner gone. Like the barking of a mountain, all the time. Yeah, I mean, every day was an adventure. It was like, what do we get to do today? We learned everything as we went, and, and it seemed to fit. It fit our, our appetite for adventure, because that's really what we went there for. I mean, I still get fluttery chest when I come around that last corner. I still love seeing it and the, you know, the mountains unfolding in front of me. And it's still like seeing it for the first time every time I go there. What does home mean to you? Hmm. I know. It, I know. It still feels like home when I when I go up there. 
I don't think that will ever go away. I guess it's the memories. Good ones, bad ones. But that's a hard question. <laughs> Home is hard. Crossing over the coast mountains took energy and time, but yielded a familiar comfort. Not the feeling you have when you're in the middle of nowhere, but the feeling you have when you're at the center of something. One foot or paddle stroke after the other, crossing this landscape was a reminder that our bodies and minds know it intimately. The rock and snow, the water and the names of the plants, better than anywhere else. Home is language, home is culture, Home is people. So home is a safe place. Home is being somewhere where I feel, where I don't have to be afraid. It's when you're in a landscape that it just makes your heart sing. And the earth is our home. I guess it's the memories. <laughs> For some of us, it's that part of the earth and people we miss most. For some of us, it's that place we're always leaving and always traveling towards. Home is hard, but you know when you found it. <laughs>